Hello and welcome to Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jard and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. We want to welcome all of you in TV land. Tonight, our discussion is on the history and culture of the Pele ethnic group. The Pele ethnic group is by far the largest ethnic group in Liberia. Our guest on the show tonight is Mr. Dennis Gassini. Mr. Gassini, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you for having me. Right. And uh, Mr. Gassini is a member of the Pele ethnic group. In fact, he will, he's one of, he's the founding member of the uh, Bone County Association in the USA. Mr. Gassini, it's a pleasure having you tonight. Same here. All right. And uh, Mr. Gassini, his expertise is in healthcare and industrial management. He's a, uh, He's the owner of Elite Nursing Services Incorporated. He holds a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's of science degree in management. He's married. He's been blessed with, uh, with six children. He's been married for 32 years. That's pretty impressive, Mr. Gassini. Thank you. And uh, he has six siblings, two girls and four boys. Uh, both parents uh, are deceased, that are Reverend David Gassini and Mrs. Mata Gassini. Again, Mr. Gassini is a founding member of the, bon Count, of the United Bond County Association in the Americas, where he served as the national vice president in the 1990s and later as national president. Additionally, he served on the board of a number of organizations. He and his wife are involved with uh, humanitarian efforts in Liberia with focus on education, healthcare, and church support. He comes from the Baptist background and currently a deacon board of his local church. And from the Baptist background, it means that uh, as soon as you eat, then you leave, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've heard, I think. <laughs> All right, so it's, uh, we, we're glad to have you. And uh, this is the history and culture of the Pele ethnic group. I want you to uh, first uh, start with us, a brief presentation on the history and culture of the Pele ethnic group. Oh, thank you, Dennis. As I, as I said, I'm glad to be here today. Um, let me first say that um, I have heard a lot about your show and it's very informative. And I believe that a lot of us can learn from the different uh, tribal groups in Liberia, uh, something that we have not been privileged to do in schools. Uh, so I'm glad to um, lend my voice to what I know historically about the uh, tribal group uh, of Liberia. Uh, history tells us that the Pele tribal group uh, derived from the Mende uh, group as well. Uh, the Mende group uh, migrated from 
Savannah, Western Sudan region and migrated to Liberia. Uh, they were the second of two groups or three groups that went from Sudan into that region. The first group were, uh, of people uh, were made up of uh, the, the Kisi and the Gola tribes. The Pele um, were made up of the second group of people involving the Mana, the uh, Loma, uh, and uh, the Baza, and several other. When they arrived in Liberia, uh, they were able to conquer the first group uh, that had settled and then quickly organized themselves under the leadership of a king in Kumba. And they were then considered uh, as uh, the Kumbas. After Kumba died, uh, the group dispersed into different tribal groups and the color was then formed like the Mano and the Baza and those who belong to the Mendi family uh, tribal group as well. The color group then moved in the 1600th uh, into Liberia, uh, further central into Liberia where they settled. Some could not make it all the way to central. Uh, they were found on the uh, eastern coast of Liberia. Uh, the ones that went into central Liberia, mainly where it, where it uh, is now known as Bond County, uh, established themselves there. Uh, there they were able to form uh, a different governing, um, uh, different governance. Uh, there was a fellow chief called uh, Nyaswa. Nyaswa was a very powerful lady. Uh, she then, uh, at birth, was given that name, Nyaswa, and then after she graduated from the Sunday Society, uh, she was then called Nyaswa Koko. And that is the lady after whom Swa Koko was named. Uh, the Pellet tribe does not have any specific meaning um, other than what people have attributed to them as hardworking and submissive people. And so the Pellet people uh, immediately began to contribute to the establishment of Liberia uh, under the influence of uh, Madame Swa Koko who at the time was used by the government to sort of bring together people from the hinterland um, to be able to advance uh, the government of Liberia from the coastal region of Montserrat into the hinter area. And they met with some resistance in the Jokwala district area. And so uh, Madame Swakoko was asked then to uh, facilitate possibility of having peaceful um, migration or the advancement of the government troops into regions such as Nimba, Grand Gita, Lofa, and so on, which it did uh, very, very uh, faithfully. And for the geography of, of, like, of, uh, of, of the Pele people, they were part of the central region of Liberia. Um, at that time, Liberia did not have uh, the the um, counties that we have now, we have five counties and then three regions. And the Pellet people where Bon County is, was considered as a, a part of the central region. It was uh, 1964 that that region became a partition and Bon County was formed as a county, all the sibling counties, Gangire, uh, Lofa, Nimba. Those three counties were then added to what, what existed before uh, bringing Liberia's total county to nine at the time. The uh, um, superintendent of the county in 1964 was Mr. James Y. Barbier. And uh, following his appointment, uh, one county was like any other county was not able to be represented in the Liberian legislature, uh, except through representations of people who did not play any major role. But following a general council, executive council meeting, they decided that it was proper 
with the advance of super, uh, some senators from the nine counties to move to Monrovia as a way of uh, giving full representation to the uh, counties in Liberia. It was when uh, Bond County was represented by Mr. Kulep Wee as a senator and Elizabeth Collins as a senator as well. 1968 was a very difficult time for Bon County. Uh, through the council, Mr. James Y. Barbier, Mr. Gabriel Fungalo, and Mr. Kennedy from Lofa were implicated in a coup attempt uh, allegedly to overthrow Tupman. And so Tupman removed uh, the three of them and imprisoned them. Following the imprisonment, Mr. Uh, uh, Corpia, Augustus Corpia became superintendent of Bond County until 1972. And Mr. Harry A. Gray Sr. was named as superintendent when it became apparent that Mr. Gore Corpia was not too healthy. Mr. Gray served in that capacity until 1976 when he was moved to Bon Marodia to serve as defense minister. Uh, then Mr. Joseph Duarte became superintendent following Mr. Harry Gray's uh, um, transition to Monrovia. 1980 was the last time that uh, Mr. Duarte served as superintendent of Bond County before the coup came, and then he was replaced by Mr. Bader Bizeze. That is the uh, history of uh, the county. Bon County was actually the city, the capital city of Bon County, which is Banga, was named after an old rice farm. Uh, in Pele, the word Bang, Bang means old farm. And so Banga derived its name from that, uh, from that Pele language of uh, old farm. Uh, the county Bang was named after Mount Bang, which formed part of the Bang Ring. And uh, there uh, were a lot of settlements uh, from Mora County. We had people from Basa, people from Nimba, people from uh, uh, Grand Basa County and Monserrado, Lofa. They came and settled in Banga. And uh, they formed part of the government. As you know, people are known to be very receptive to others, they are very submissive. And so they were not. Uh, in the position to drive away others, to share power with them, those who were settlers in the county. Uh, as far as government goes, uh, we have parliament chiefs. Uh, before the establishment of Bond County, we have parliament chiefs, we have county commissioners who were appointed dire directed by the central government. And then following the creation, those parliament chiefs being elected by uh, the people within their jurisdictions and uh, the commissioners were still appointed by the central government. And so that's what the, the uh, kind of government council of Bond County uh, um, was and still is. Of course, in recent times, there have been no election of those chiefs. There's still an appointment of the various uh, county superintendents, uh, district commissioners, Empowerment chief. That said, though, we still have uh, a localized government where people have general town chiefs uh, representing their quarters and so on. And that's the brief history of the of the Pele uh, tribe, how they migrated from Sudan into central Liberia and settled in other areas of, of, of Liberia and uh, continue to stay there at the time. Uh, one piece of information I also like to share is that. The Pele tribe did not all migrate to just Bong or to Liberia. Some of them moved to Guinea, some moved to Mali, some of them in Mauritania, and they still are. And in those countries, they are not known there as Pele. Although right. we in Bong County still call them Pele, call them Guinea Pele. In Mali, they have a different name. We call them the uh, Ese, uh, some call them the Pese, and uh, there are several other names that they are known in those regions. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dennis. If you're just joining us, this is uh, Focus on Liberia. We are discussing tonight the history and culture of the Pele ethnic group and their contribution to Liberia. 
Our guest to discuss this is uh, the founding member and uh, first president and uh, also president of the United Bond Country Association in the Americas. He's also from the Pella ethnic group and his name is Mr. Dennis Gassini. Mr. Gassini, uh, what does Pella mean? And uh, it, how Pella people pronounce it? Is that the real way I'm calling it? Well, it, it depends on who it is that you are asking. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, I call it Pella, the kid is silent. Okay. That is how the, you are writing it. That's how the language is actually pronounced. Uh, it's Pella, some body of Pella, meaning that the K is active. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it does not have any specific meaning other than a name given to identify a certain tribal group in Liberia. Right. But how Pella people call themselves? If you went in the in the uh, deep part of the village, how mm -hmm. would they? How do you refer to yourself? I, I know they won't say Pele. Uh, in, in that case, there was a there was a Pele, Pele Mwanyan, that's a Pele name. I'm a Pele person. Oh. So that Pele is actually that's a, that's, that's pretty much known as as the general way of calling it. Uh, personally, again, like I said, I I call it something different. It depends on what region of the county you are in, but we have different color groups. We have the Sanoye group. Uh, they might be able to call themselves something different. But generally, it is just Pele. Right. So yes, and then uh, you got Pele from Lufa County also because I've, I feel I uh, kind of you know interacted with them from the Paye area. You have mm -hmm. Pele in Mangibi. You have Pele in other parts of Liberia. Are they the <laughs> same? What is the difference in the the language and our culture, or is everything the same? Well, yeah, you're, you're quite right. Uh, if you travel from Zozo district all the way to the Salaye district, ending at St. Paul River in Balatwa area, that's a whole Pella region. Uh, their Pella is a little deep when they pronounce certain things. Then you get to the Salaye area, they have a different pronunciation of atoms from the, the Jokwala area. I will give you one example. Uh, Sanoye Pele called Cutlice Bia. The Jokwala uh, Pele called Cutlice Bula. So those are the kind of differences you will find in, in the accent and, and, uh, and, and, and perhaps how they call different things. Uh, the Pele in Guinea uh, have a very um, unique pronunciation of certain things and how to say different words. Um, if you listen keenly, you will find that they are identical. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yes, uh, while there, it is true that the Pella tribe is an identity, there are different category, uh, different categories that really identify a certain group of Pella. Right. Uh, the Sanoye Pella have different categories, different ways of saying things. The Bopolo Pella is the same thing. They have different ways of saying certain things. You go to uh, Zozo area, of course, Salaya area, Lower Lofa, they have a whole different way of calling certain things. So, so there are, there are you, you find in Nimba and the ones in Grand Basa, uh will call this, the same thing, say the same thing as the Pella in, in uh, the Pella area. There's no difference. Now, the Pella in Bangashiakwala area, which is a bordering Guinea, they have a different name for certain things. Right. Then you have your Jokola Pella, you have to listen very keenly to know what the Sanoye Pella is talking about, or uh, a Bangashiakola Pella is talking about, or the one from Zaza is talking about, because different names, different um, accent for those names of identical thing that they are trying to name. So, do I believe there should be subgroup of Pella? Do, they, do they, the subgroups have names, distinct names? The subgroup uh, in Liberia have the same name. They are okay. Pele. But if you start going to uh, the Mauritania Pele, the Guinea Pele, of course, the Guinea Pele are, are what they call the, the, the uh, uh, Kuse. Uh, sometimes they call them Kasi. If you go to Mali, they call them uh, uh, Bun, B-U-N. Uh, in Mauritania, of course, it's the same as the Bun, but sometimes they put in the Malin. Uh, so they are different. Different, different names. All right. So now we, we talk about first the, the early migration of the Pella people coming mm -hmm. to what is known today as Liberia. 
So I believe at that time too, they have some form of government, maybe chiefs or what, what was, how, how they move, what was their form of government, who was leading them, or what was the government structure look like? During the migration, they had chiefs, they had uh, what they called uh, um, every family, a certain group of family will come together and, and, and form themselves under uh, the control of a chief. And that chieftaincy was responsible for governing uh, that group. Not beyond that, because central government had no control over them, uh, but they were more accountable to, the chiefs were accountable to their followers. And that's what they had. Well, if you, if you um, look at the history in the 1600s, uh, in central Liberia, that was a whole different thing. Uh, Madame Swakoko, for instance, became a clan chief. And the reason for her becoming a clan chief was because the government was trying to uh, use her as a way of getting uh, peace with people from the hinterland. And, and, and so in the 1600, when she was appointed by Daniel E. Howard as a, super, as a, as a, a clan chief, she controlled a large region, um, but it, that region did not form a client as it is now. It formed only a few towns uh, to be called a client. That time there was no farmer chief, there was no superintendent either. And so during the migration, we were only governed by by um, what they call chiefs. They call them quarter chiefs. Right. And, and that's an interesting piece of history to see that uh, we had a woman as chief, and in fact, the name Swakoko, that, that's, that's, a, that's a woman. Because most of the time, uh, Africans are thought of, of not really giving you know, place for women. Oh, yes, I, and, 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 and the reason for her selection, there were, there were different qualities that uh, Madame Swakoko had. Uh, few that really stood up um, are that she was, she was a good organizer, she was uh, someone who was peaceful, uh, she was someone who knew how to bring people. She knew how to manage crisis. And based on those criteria, um, she was named a clan chief to be able to bring people together from that, that entire region, um, extending from, from uh, all the way from Torota uh, to where, where we now call Jokwela. Uh, because at that time, there were no chieftaincy. And because of her influence in the area, they decided to use her as, as a clan chief hoping that she would use her talent to calm the storm uh, so that government forces would be able to penetrate that region uh, to go to the hinterland. Because the Jokola era could not allow government forces to pass through there. And it was Madame Swakopo's influence that caused that advancement. Tell, talk to me about education and uh, religion among the Pella people from the ancient time to now? Well, ancient time, uh, the only form of education that uh, Liberians had institutionally, uh, people had institutionally, uh, were either through the foreign society or the Sunday society. That's where uh, the Sunday society is where young women learn to do everything from cocaine, from home management, uh, obedience, and everything. The men were cut. Uh, to do farming, uh, to be confidential, uh, and to be respectful, and all of that. So those were only two schools that existed. Maybe well, besides the parental schooling, um, for instance, the young man had to follow the father, uh, who taught you know him uh, how to do certain things that he had been taught by his forefather, and the woman, young girl, was also you know, taught by the mother to do certain things. Uh, but to really a good extent, uh, they had to go to, to the Sunday society or prone society for what they call advanced education. Uh, the other thing that happened there was that uh, they were given different names upon graduation. Uh, and, and so that became very important part of their, of their, of their process of education. Talk to me more on that naming convention. So they were given name apart from their name. So how names, in fact, come to play among Pella people? Well, I mean, I uh, I will give you again, Madame Swakopo at birth, she was called 
Nyaswa. Uh, At that time, she has not, uh, she had not joined the Sunday San Society, but on graduation, uh, she was named uh, Swa. And uh, in the pellet naming convention, uh, it depends on the structure of the person who is being named or skin complexion. For instance, uh, a light skinned person would be called Tamba. Tamba means light skin. And so someone who has a long neck, uh, we we'll call them Goma, means that you know they got a long neck. Uh, a man, for instance, if he's uh, strong and uh, authoritative, we'll call him Kukla. Uh, so someone who is, uh, you know, his other name would be like Kamu, depending on skin complexion of the man as well. Sumo was a name given to someone with a lot of strength. And so that's how the name convention uh, was actually determined. People were named based on uh, their attributes, their physical, or um, just the way they behave. So, so if a baby is born today, how is that name determined? A uh, baby born today would not be named, uh, I mean, if you're talking about ancient time, Right. It will be named something. In some in some cases, it will give them the name of the of the day of the week that they were born. Uh, for instance, they were born on either Sade or they will call them Nekula, meaning that Nekula is the same as white, white lady. Uh, but Nekula is not going to be the name until they go to school and are giving the proper name. But they will give them some teacher's name until they have gone through the um uh, the Santa Society or the Prone Society would formally be giving their name. What's about religion? At that time, and up, even up to today, what's the dominant religion among the Pella people? Again, that depending on which region of the Pella people. Uh, in the Lofa area, we are talking mainly Lutheran. Uh, upper Lower Bong area, that's the Saraye, Salala, uh, former, uh, uh, perhaps around the Yakula area, uh, that's the Lutheran, um, Lutheran church. Further central into Bong County, you will find a lot of Baptists. Uh, in the Kakata area, some Baptists as well. Of course, that's not part of Bong, but um, it used to be. Uh, so those are the two dominant uh, religions that you find there. The Catholic, yes. Uh, Catholic um, churches are their word in, in, in Liberia. You find them mainly in, in uh, maybe the urban area like uh, in Banga. Uh, you'll find a Catholic church uh, and, and institution. Um, their expansion was actually based on education. Uh, with that education came the church. Uh, but Lutheran, of course, uh, was really meant for the church because they had Lutheran missionaries and they had Baptist missionaries. Prior to that, though, their religious institution was different. They actually worship spirits. Um, for them, they called them jina. Uh, that was when people felt that um, if someone died, uh, or if someone died, that the spirit of that person is a god, and so they worship, they worship that spirit. Um, but that was short life once the missionaries started coming in the southern churches like the Baptist and the Lutheran and Catholic. Let's let's talk a little. Let's talk about the language, the Pele language. Where mm -hmm. does it come from? So the Pele language again um, after it came from the Mende uh, fam, uh, uh, language family. Uh, the actual region uh, is, is, is the, the uh, um, Niger Congo region. That's where they came from, one of the Mende uh, uh, language family. Yeah. After Kumba died, that group that came that were part of the Mende language family separated themselves into different tribes. And that's the origin of the Pele. Just as the Mano and the Basa uh, and the Loma, they were all part of the Mende. And so the Pele derived from that Mende group from the Niger uh, Congo region that uh, migrated into Liberia. So, so now, uh, 
Is there any written form of the, the Pele language? Oh, yes. Um, there are several. Uh, the Lutheran Church, back in the early 60s, established uh, a written book. Yeah, there was a Pele book that was called Pelica. Pelica was a primary Pele learn, uh, a learner. Anyone who wanted to learn Pele, that's what they used, uh, the Pelica. And over that, after Kalika became mastered by some missionaries, uh, they went further to uh, publish the New Testament into Pele. Uh, that New Testament is called Banango Kenina. Now, if you look at the New Testament uh, at that time, the words in the New Testament are a little different because they were produced in, in lower, lower bong by within the Sanoy area. So they are mostly sound Pele. If you were to tell the Jokola person to read that, that book, it was a little bit of complication because, again, uh, there were different things were all different. Uh, like, for instance, God. Uh, in the Jokola era, we call it Gala. Uh, in the sound area, it's called Allah. So that's a different, uh, those are the difference in, in their, in their uh, languages. Um, the Pele was actually the written Pele started in the Sanoye area. Uh, by, um, I believe it was Chief Hidden. Uh, he produced the uh, Pele language and then the Lutheran uh, you know, came in and refined it and uh, published the first literature, which is the Kalika, followed by the Bible um, or the New Testament. Two years ago, they were able to publish the entire Old Testament in Pele as well. But yeah, they do have a written language. Do, do you know about the alphabets? If there are how many alphabets? Because some of these certain alphabets in the English are not in those languages. I don't know if you. Well, I haven't taken keen note of that. Uh, when I'm reading the Bible, for instance, or when I'm writing, uh, Alphabets are not really known because they, 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 are, they are mostly uh, symbols. Uh, because, for instance, when you're trying to talk about P, P in Pele would have been, if you were just talking about the English, it would just be an E or followed by maybe another vowel. In the Pele, that E is Y and an E. Um, but if you look at the Pele language, the Pele alphabet, why there's not an alphabet in Pala either? So the question, the answer would be no. There is a set uh, number of, 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 of alphabets in the Pala language of the dialect. Uh, it's a combination of different symbols uh, depending on where that origin is from. So, so what are Pala people known for in, in Liberia? Um, a lot of people that are known for our work. Uh, they are known for submissiveness. They are known for peacemaking. They are known for um, humility. They are known for uh, acceptability of other people. Um, there are other. They are, they are family oriented. They. they uh, you will see a pillar man. He will have his wife and children. Uh, oftentimes. Uh, that family setting has several wives, depending on uh, the, the individual culturally. Um, but they're known for, for a lot of things. And um, among them, of course, primarily, I guess that they're submissive and hardworking. Right. So sometimes there is a disconnect between these things and then how, you know, on the uh, national level, how that submissiveness, the hard work, the family orient, being family oriented, how does that translate on the national level, especially in our uh, governance structure? If you have some examples or some scenarios. The, to be very honest, being part of it, and this is my personal view, I, I think to some extent, the, the, the attribute of submissiveness uh, sometimes come back to haunt them and hurt them. Uh, yes, it's good to be submissive, uh, but to the extent where your own interest is, is placed in jeopardy, I think that, uh, in my view, is uh, detrimental. Um, but people oftentimes, government uh, in Liberia or leaders in Liberia oftentimes fall to the people 
or the county uh, for leadership in terms of uh, peace seeking. Uh, if, if there's chaos, they oftentimes turn to the other person uh, to settle uh, that chaos. Or someone who wants to advance him or herself politically uh, is going to go down to the third person or other people and tell them, well, you know, I need your support because, of course, this is my, uh, this is my destiny. And um, they won't easily say no to that. Um, and that's how they've been used in so many ways for um, by a lot of people to get to their, their destiny. Whether that's a good attitude to have, personally, I, I wouldn't say yes, it is. Um, in my role as, as, as national president of the United Bank Association, for instance, uh, I, I liaised with other national organizations from Grant Gillett, uh, Honor Willem Yano, uh, Mr. Abraham Masale from Cape Mount, Maryland, uh, Honor Mariah Seaton, uh, Nima County, Kambasa. We were able to really see peace in Liberia. Uh, in the early early uh, 2000s, and and so yes, that is part of the the, the fellow people, and I, I believe that that it is a good attribute to have peacemaking, peace loving people, but whether that plays for them uh, and and you know benefits them all the time, I I don't know. Th th thank you. Now, or uh, there's a question or comments on Facebook. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, Dr. Samuel Ngovo. He's, he's an historian, so I'm expecting history question. <laughs> he said, I know the Bandi and the Pele belong to the Southwestern Mende speaking language group. Sure. They have a lot in common in terms of traditions and customs. Mm -hmm. uh, do totemic belief exist among the Pele people? I think that uh, what could be some of the differences between the Liberian Pele and the Guinea Pele? Are the names uncle and enter in Pele language? Who is it? Who is referred to as uncle or auntie? I know those are loaded questions, but do your best as you can. First, he said about totemic belief. I don't know what totemic belief is. And uh, what could be the differences between the Guinea Pele and the Labrin Pele? Um, in a pellet, uh, well, let me first go to the, uh, the first first um, part of his question, which is the satanic belief. Um, and I did allude to that earlier. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't really studied studied the uh, pellet tribe thoroughly. Uh, but the pellet tribe, of course, like I said before, they believe in um, serving. Uh, as a spirit, uh, they believe in Gina, they believe in, in traditions, uh, they call African science and stuff like that. Um, what they are known for distinctly uh, for the Pele in Liberia is, is their school, their traditional school. is a second to none. Um, that's the Sonnet and Peron societies. Um, I'm not sure if the Guinea Pele has that level of, of, of traditional schooling either. That's a difference that you'll find between them. Uh, their singing and sometimes cultural differences are there. The Liberian Pele, um, they believe in, they got some very good, uh, good arts. In Guinea, I'm not sure that it's the same, but when it comes to uh, uh, folk songs and, and traditional dancing and stuff like that, yes. Um, one of, one of the difference that I see, I was reading the Ten Commandments uh, in Pele from Guinea. And believe it or not, I have to study that over a few days to be able to identify some of the words um, compared to what I know of the Liberian Ten Commandments. But there are, yes, there are some differences. So that, that's, that's in the language. What's about culture? The culture, um, there is in much of a difference. Again, when you go to the environmental culture, uh, I think the environment sort of influenced culture. Um, the ones that have come to Liberia have kind of changed our culture a little bit. Um, there are certain things that Liberian pellets do that uh, if you call them, 
Uh, Ian Pelle would not do. Again, um, we were talking about about uh, food stuff and and farming and uh, education um, and and th and their and their traditional schools is a little bit different. Um, again, not being a, a you know affiliated with that in I, I don't know distinctly how uh, that culture is different from that of the Liberian Pella. Oh, all right. Now. If you're just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. Our discussion tonight is the history and culture of the Pele ethnic group. And uh, if you want to call in, just uh, call my number, call 978-726-6965 to, uh, to call in. And uh, you can also post your question on Facebook. We should be able to uh, ask our guest, Mr. Dennis Gassini. Now, Mr. Gassini, we, we talk about the history. Now, there is a, the process of getting married, dating and, and getting married. How the Pella people do that? Uh, believe it or not, traditionally, if I was still in the traditional setting, I probably would not because it is tedious. Um, first, um, let's say that a young man finds someone, a girl to whom uh, they want to get married. Uh, they would engage that person um, through either the father uh, of the bride uh, of the groom or the uncle of the groom will go to the parents of the bride and uh, tell them what it is their desire is. Uh, of course, that all or not always plays a better role, um, followed by maybe a coin can be 25 cents at the time they were still coined in Liberia. Um, and after uh, that initial step is satisfied, um, the man will have to work for the parent of the bride for seven years. Uh, work meaning farming, uh, say housework uh, of, a, of a male. Uh, and after seven years, uh, they are formally married. Uh, he goes and pays forty dollars as a dowry, and then he is best to move on with his wife into his home, uh, into his own home. And so that is the the uh, process that is used to wed uh, in the Pella tribe. Um, now that has been a little bit watered down by the Western um, tradition or the Western idea of marriage uh, is a little bit different. The missionaries have come and uh, religion has come also and probably changed that a little bit. But traditionally, that was the method that was used. Now, you, you, you talk about seven years of work. So the girl should be maybe very younger to do seven years because if the girl was already maybe 20 by the time you complete seven years, so, so tell me uh, the age at which, you know, at that time people get married in the Pele ethnic group. It is often after the person has left the Sunday society, uh, either when they are presenting them to the, to the community, uh, that's when most of them are engaged. Um, and you are talking about the age group of maybe uh, 13, I could be a little bit wrong there of the number, um, 13 to 18. Um, so yeah, that's about the age group where they are either engaged and 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 are um, well, engaged. Yeah. What's about divorce? Because people get divorced too. Is that is there a process to that? Well, the divorce, uh, there is no um, society without uh, the divorce process. is a little bit, little bit different. Um, when a wife decides that uh, he. I mean, she does, no, she does not want to continue into the marriage. Of course, uh, she goes back to the parent. And let's say there was a conflict uh, between her and the husband to move to her parent. And stay there until the husband comes to settle uh, the issue, that conflict. Uh, if she's satisfied, she will go back with him home. If she isn't, 
and insists that she wants to file for a divorce, then of course the parents will have to pay $140 um, back to the man, uh, to the husband. Uh, that, uh, that will be able to, um, to beat the divorce process. In most cases, they'll go to court. Uh, they'll go to traditional court uh, to complete the process as well. What are some of the grounds for divorce in the appellate ethnic group? Ground for divorce could be uh, of many. Um, perhaps the, the, the lady is abused. Um, perhaps the man is, is lazy and the lady does not want to stay in a marriage. Uh, the lady um, is a parent, not able to born children. Um, the husband will probably you know, choose to divorce her or if the man is not able to, to uh, produce children, um, the lady would divorce her. But for the most part, it, it is either uh, that of being uh, lazy and um, over the lady feels overworked, um, or there's a internal conflict um, arising between them, uh, either physical abuse and stuff like that, or even a verbal abuse uh, have been part of the contributing factors too. Is there is it how is it different now or is it the same? Well, it it is it is different now um, because uh, the, the the economic setting that we currently have is not what it once was. Um, think, for instance, if the parent uh, is going to allow the daughter to divorce, they have to come up with one hundred forty dollars. Uh, is that re readily available? Probably not. Um, secondly, uh, husbands are not getting married to 10, 15, 20 wives like they used to. Right. Um, so the divorce rate is a little bit different. Uh, when they did at the time, a husband who has 15 wives, uh, if one of the wives feels that she is being disrespected by one of the other wives, uh, that was a reason for a divorce. But as the number of wives decrease, I think that the number of divorces also increase, but that decreases because yeah. you know those factors are no longer there. All right, Doctor Doctor Sam Ngovo defined totemic belief as uh, taboos or things that they, you don't eat. Like, uh, is there you know beliefs among the Pella people that uh, you don't eat certain things or you don't do certain things, and that sometimes form the basis of. Uh, relationship or kinship? Well, yes, uh, I'm glad he put that point um, on because put that point up because certain tribal group, family group, <clears throat> they are identified by that taboo. Uh, take for instance, in my family, we're not allowed to eat snail. And so that's our taboo. So if I find someone else who has the same taboo, uh, I will kind of think that there is some lineage there um, because that's, that's an extension of our family uh, because we have the same taboo. Uh, some people would not eat uh, certain fruit. Uh, some would not eat uh, certain food. And, and so, yes, um, family extension derived from those taboos as well. And, and what can be some of the reason for those taboos? Like snail, I love snail, and you can't eat it. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, I, I, I think it's just a fictitious thing. It's not really. And it's when you find someone tells you that if you eat this, it's going to happen. Right. So my family, they're told that if, if they eat snail, they'll lose all their teeth. Well, I've eaten snail so many times. I still have teeth in my mouth. Um, but. Was I being disrespectful to that taboo? Probably not. But when I was growing up, um, I didn't resist it because my mom was able to cook it. And, and, and so the reason for taboo is not really a specific thing, but a makeup thing that if you ate this kind of food, it's going to happen to you. And that's how most of the taboo issues are respected and upheld. Okay. Yeah, for, for some, the taboo, sometimes they say, well, when you were in war, I know of a group of family that when mm -hmm. they were in war, 
there was a turtle that helped them to cross a river. They said the turtle was so big and they were being pursued by the enemy forces. So when they got to this river, there was no way for them to cross and they were being pursued. And, you know, magically there appeared a turtle and they were able to walk on that turtle's back and cross the river. So turtle became like their savior. Mm -hmm. So since then when they see a turtle, they just wish it well and um, perform some ritual and say, go in peace. Yeah. Maybe and yeah, that's a very good point because uh, take for instance, again, in the pellet, in the pellet tribe, you find people who claim to be into some animal, some sort of animal. Uh, some would say I'm a snake. Some would say that I'm, I'm, I'm a water person. So people who, someone who is into water, uh, creatures don't eat, would not eat a uh, fish. Um, the same with the snake. Someone who is into a snake is not going to be eating snake because that becomes their taboo. Hmm. Yeah, it's something I wanted to mention on the name because uh, some names are, you know, some languages are like, one syllable, so sometimes their names are like one syllable names, like in a manner you are ye, you are ko, you are se, you know, those are all one syllable. How the names, you know, in Pele, uh, is it uh, most of it one syllable as well or two or more? Well, I uh, understand that, that uh, Pele, uh, the Pele people, because they are from the same uh, linguistic family, the Mendi, they share names. Um, the people have Po also, they have Lopu, uh, they have Koto, and Manapu have those names. Uh, they have Pe. Uh, Pe is a common name between Pele and Mano. Uh, when you go to, to the Loma side of things, it's the same thing. They share common names. Uh, Pele people have some names that are just short, uh, but because as, as, as someone who is who is a union to someone that is that is more senior, we have to add handle to that name. Mm -hmm. That's when it becomes either two uh, two names. Like for instance, you would not call uh Pa is a it's, it's just one pillar name. If I were calling someone who is older than me, I'm not gonna just call her Pan. I would say no Pan. It means that I'm honoring her uh, mm -hmm. as an elderly person. Uh, so most of the pillar names that are just one uh, will have to carry the handle to make them too, out of yeah. respect. Let, let's go to, to literature and talk about some Pele folk tales, some uh, Pele proverbs, some Pele parables, and some Pele stories. Well, you, you're carrying me in, uh, in the wrong territory there, but uh, I'll do my best. Yeah. So uh, Pele stories, when we were growing up uh, and when stories were still being told in Liberia, in the Pele, among the Pele tribe, uh, the most common character in the Pele story was spider. Um, every story that I ever heard, uh, the character there was a spider. Either the character was the spider was a hero, uh, the other was either a turtle, or um, the other was just some makeup person. And so uh, take for instance, if we were finding it difficult to go to bed at night, um, a story would be told about a child that doesn't like to go to bed on time. And that story will oftentimes uh, be told not because it is, it is a set story or a historical story, but it is made up by Either the parent who wants to uh, put their child in bed, bed on time. Uh, that said, there are some stories, uh, you know, that that are told about a pretty person. Um, the one that really stick to me was uh, a story about a spider who would go and pick the yam during the hunger season, and then comes home and tells his wife, "If you tell me what stick I use to pick this yam with." And you will eat some of the yam, but if you don't tell me the name of the steak, then you will not eat any. And those are stories that were actually made that are more uh, comic in setting. And 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 um, for me personally, I didn't grow up in that area, so storytelling was not really one that I have I have mastered and mm -hmm. and uh, and well versed in to say, well, this is the kind of story that um, and this or this story 
it's that. Uh, it didn't happen. There are also, also some riddles. There are some things that were said in politics, for instance, one of them was said that a black fly that sticks on a body, on a dead body, risk being buried with it. Hmm. Um, that's, that's a parable that would mean that if you get, if, if you follow a toll maker all the time, you end up in it with, it is, with the same fit. Right. Um, so they're, they're all over the place. Um, but I'm not really well versed in them to tell you the whole piece of it. Um, because to some extent, of course, I'm just a little bit uh, contaminated, if you will. Um, <laughs> okay. My, my boss of blood also. Uh, I, I, Mr. Gassini, I did some research and I found some uh, Pele proverbs. Okay. Let me read it and then you tell me, or you say in Pele, they say, okay. as a crab walks, so the children so walk its children the same way the well, crab walk that's how the children it, walk yeah uh again from the jawala pellet which is what i am part of uh crab is young uh the people call crab young so being as here meaning that you will not find uh any other creature walking behind behind Crab, other than its children, unless of course that crab is a is a is a prey to something right. else, and it will be following. Uh, it will be followed by whatever wants to uh, destroy it. Right. Yeah, that's that's the interpretation of that. Of another, that. Another another one say a person is not a corn that you peel and see the seeds. Uh, say that again. A person is not a corn that you will peel the corn and see the seeds. Like in other words, you would never determine a you know a person was in the heart, right? Exactly. You you will not you will not know what is in the heart of a person. Right. What, what what is their mindset? And this is my favorite, this is my personal favorite. If you are not inside a house, you do not know about its leaking. How would the Pella people say that? Well, <laughs> um, but uh, there is there there is a reverse of that, or maybe should I say um, a little bit of a, a sister parable to that, uh, which is, uh, and I will say in Pella because the English is a little bit different, difficult for me. Uh, meaning that if if you have a somebody would say, for instance, if you during the days when people carry used labor, uh, forced labor, and they will carry a bag of rice on their head, and they have a master behind them. That master will keep telling them, let's go, no time to rest. The master is, is taking the term of that journey because he or she, or he is not carrying a similar weight yeah. on his head. And so that's exactly what it is that that riddle, that parable that you just, you just did it, I mean. If you are right. not in a situation, you will not know how the way it is. Right. Okay. Um, let's go to pellet food. You know, some of the food that uh, pellet people love and that originate from the pellet region. Well, pellet people love rice. Um, that's their primary. They have different species of rice. Uh, depending on what species that you are talking about, uh, people like them based on their taste. Uh, the pellet will have a rice called BC. BC is a little bit rough. Uh, not everyone likes it because no matter how you cook it and what uh, soup it is cooked with, it, it, it is not a good tasty rice. It grows wild, it grows well. Uh, there is another rice which is a long grain rice. It is named after the male. Uh, M-A-L-E, uh, they, they call it nanyang, nanyang mean a milk beet. Uh, they're long and narrow and very, very refined. And, and so that's one of the best rice that we have uh, in Liberia. So yeah, the club will eat a lot of rice, uh, those types. And there is another form of rice, which is not really rice, but it falls within a rice family. The club will call it, uh, it's like, um, like a wheat. Um, they eat a lot of rice, but they eat a lot of that. Uh, and then they supplement their food with cassava. And you all know cassava is not of, of, of a Liberian origin. 
uh, a come from Brazil, but somehow uh, the people love that. They can either eat cassava uh, in different form, either as a fufu, the tomboy, or just plainly cooked. They also eat a lot of yam, uh, a lot of fruit, a lot of palm cabbage, and so on. And so those are some of the food products that the Pele people do have. Wait a minute. You say Pele eat palm cabbage? Oh, yes. And how come they talk palm cabbage about the gribbles alone? <laughs> of course, that's stereotyping, that's stereotyping right? And we'll Sometimes come to you, 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 you try to uh, you try to uh, paint on other people. But yeah, the Pele people eat a lot of palm cabbage. Uh, oh, okay. Now, what what's about uh, you know that's the that's the right, but we always you know supplement that with soup. So on the pellet side, what is the major soup? Um, the, the pellet side again, economic influence uh, and and uh, impact. Oftentimes, we're not allowed the pellet person who wants to really eat that kind of food to eat them. Uh, so let's say in the absence of soup, if it is affordable, um, they will cook little grains, a sour leaf, uh, arrow soup, um, local yam soup, local palm cabbage as a soup as well. Uh, arrow soup, those are all things that a lot of people will eat. They have another one they call power salts. They eat a lot of that. Um, and water grains. Uh, those are the soup that 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 uh, soup type that they like to eat. And another thing that maybe I didn't mention, the Pele people like to hunt, they like to fish. Pele women, they will fish all day if you give them the chance. The men will hunt all night if you give them the chance. So meat product uh, usually you know are used uh, to cook you know the soup, and then they're they're uh, applied to the rice, and that's their diet. In the, in the case where those are not affordable or available, they will cook dry rice with palm oil and some, and some uh, okra. Or they will cook dry rice and put some uh, oil sauce over it, and that becomes what I call the jerk rice, and they eat that with palm oil. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, they, they're not restricted to a specific kind of food. If it is dry, they will eat it. But they always make sure that it is proper for their health. I know uh, the Pella people work very hard, and you alluded to that. But the farm work or other work, are, that's divided between the male and the female. What are some of the typical work uh, the male will do that a female would not do and vice versa? Well, I mean, it depends on farm what work. era you're talking about. Uh, before then, um, you find a Pella a communal group like a pool, you will not you will find all men for brushing uh, the farm for felling trees, um, for after they burn the farm, if the farm is not well burned, for clearing the branches and stuff like that. Find mostly those are the paths for for man for man. Um, the woman was responsible for, for harvesting and for broadcasting. And tilting the, the soil with the with the rice, um, driving bird was the function for both, and the harvesting was solely the woman's responsibility at the time. So, what most element typical pellet person did, a pellet man did, uh, those who had several wives, like some that I knew, um, probably have about twelve wives, and so he made the largest farm there is. Um, and um, once he find people to brush the farm, of course he had followers, brush the farm, he, he left the farm, the rest of it to the wife. In today's Liberia, of course, that has the little bit has changed. Mm -hmm. Farm women doing everything. They are now part of the crew to brush the farm. In most cases, they brush the farm themselves. Um, they fell trees, uh, even though that's a responsibility of the man. Um, they broadcast and took the land, uh, even though that's you know, that's their job, of course. They clean, they also clear the farm, the branches. That farm didn't get burned very well. And so tasks are not really assigned now as they were prior. 
Um, but before then, uh, those were the tasks that men were uh, assigned to do. Uh, brushing the farm, making sure the farm is cleared, the land, uh, the farm is burnt, uh, the branches are cleared and prepared for the woman to come and broadcast and tilt the land. There's a Reuben Cooper say, he's proud to be Pele. <laughs> Based on the discussion, I think even what you're saying made Reuben to even be proud more. He said, uh, is Bapolu a Pele name? Is, is that a Pele word? Bapolu. Oh, let me pronounce it the Pele way. Bapolu. Bapolu is a Pele name. Okay. What does that mean? You know? Uh, you know, again, people have um, different the pronunciation is now different. The more westernized we become, just like uh, I said earlier, the city Banga is not supposed to be called Banga. It's supposed to be called Banga uh, Old Spot. And that's the same with Bapolu. Bapolu, uh, and so when you, when you it's, it's uh, like you, you create a deterrent to hide yourself behind a certain thing, I'll be the bush. Uh, you call that bar. I'm hiding behind this. It could mean something different, but from what I know and the interpretation that I know, that's what it means. Let's talk about stereotypes. I know, uh, neg especially negative stereotypes, they are all over the place in Liberia. Mm -hmm. What are some of the stereotypes of the Pella people, their origin, and how can we dispel those stereotypes? Stereotyping the Pele people um, is a is a common thing uh, to different tribes. Um, generally, they will stereotype like your Pele person as being stupid, um, which derives from uh, the extent of their civility, the extent of their submissiveness. Uh, humbleness, um, the, the extent of their kindness, all of those things put together, uh, people think that the better man is stupid, uh, which is the general stereotypical uh, attributes that is given to a fella. Um, some of the other things, and I think I shared this with you the other day, uh, on the other side of things, they will look at the better person differently. Um, like a better person is a well dressed, the boss of man would say, Oh, uh, Zaba died, better man wear trousers. Meaning that when Zaba was alive, better man would not wear trousers. It was different. Mm -hmm. And um, but now that he's dead, uh, the better man has become a well dressed person. Uh, those are just some of the stereotypical mm -hmm. beliefs that people have about the better people. Um, there are many. Uh, yeah. I guess probably get, can get all of them. Right. Those are a few that really, really stick up. And, and some of sometimes those stereotypes come from your neighbors the, because sometimes we refer to other tribes, you know, in a stereotypical way. Mm -hmm. If you so, how do Pella people refer to their neighbors because you are bordered by other ethnic groups? How do you call them? I read. Uh, like the name Mano mm -hmm. came from Pella people, named them Ma people, meaning Mano. And today, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Ma people are called Mano based on what the Pella people call them. How mm -hmm. do you call other ethnic groups, especially your neighbors? Uh, um, to be very honest, the, the Pella people, one of the things that I notice about them, they are not. Uh, don't demean other tribes. In Loma, for instance, the, the, the Lofa people, the Pele people call their uncle tribe. They are, they are their uncle. Um, the, the Mano people, like in my case, uh, having some Mano background, they we we call, uh, from the Kokoya area, we'll call the Mano people uh, my uncle tribe. Um, the only tribe that, that Pele people sometimes pick them a lot. Maybe it would be the Basa. Uh, and why they call them is lazy. Um, so that's, that's, that's the common thing personally that I've seen. 
um, but to really see them uh, calling someone something else because they want to be you know, stereotypical about, about that tribe, no. Um, because they do respect all their, ne their neighboring tribes as well. What, what do you see as a major contribution of the uh, Pele ethnic group to the country called Liberia, being there in whatever field? Well, let's say, for instance, uh, art. Uh, the Pele tribe have some of the most beautiful arts uh, you'll find. Uh, weaving, um, carving, um, matting, um, I mean, you name it. We've made tremendous contribution in those contributions in those area. Uh, and again, I'll go back to Madame Suwa Koko. Uh, in 1926, uh, following her intervention, um, that brought about uh, the, 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 the advancement uh, into, a, into a rural part of Liberia, um, her, her, her reward, or through her in, instrumentality, they were able to bring in Clinton University College was built in Banga. Uh, Phoebe was built by the uh, by the Lutheran Church. Of course, Cotton was built by the Episcopal. Uh, Central Agriculture Agricultural Institute Perry was built by the government. Um, all the contributions that they've made, um, the people again have been on a peace front. Um, again, I will talk about a few of them. Uh, Madam Swako being one of them, Basi Pangbai, uh, made tremendous contribution. I mean, it is understated because, uh, take for instance, during the general executive council that was held in Banga in 1968, uh, Basi Pangbai was one of those that was implicated as being involved in a failed government. Basi um, Pangbai uh, strictly got up and told the president, you know what? Um, I'm not educated. Um, but if I were, you should understand that you wouldn't be president today. Um, yet with that, he was very instrumental in, in bringing about peace in, in the real, real part of Liberia. Uh, integration. The better people have really helped to integrate. They have a lot of Loma. They have a lot of Mano uh, settlers in, in the area. Uh, they're farming. In, in the year 19... 76, 74 to 6, Don County came number one in food production three times in a row. Uh, they, they, they produced the most rice, most agricultural products. So both education now of uh, agriculturally, yes, they have, on the peace front they have, educationally they have as well. They have some of the best educated people in the world, uh, in, in Liberia. And so, yes, yeah, they have pride uh, in the art area they also have from musically of course they have i mean that falls under under the art and culture they have contributed a lot uh to uh folk music um sadly some of them have passed but yes they made tremendous contributions as well okay uh we, we were talking about bipolar there's a comment from d real law on facebook she says, uh, Ba is a river, Bo is a mountain, before is Bama district and Bopolu district. Has the two districts combined into a county, they combine both names as Bapolu. So that, that was a... Uh, okay. Um, uh, like, I, like I said earlier, it could have meant something different. Right. Game Ba is, is, a, is a deterrent or something that you hide yourself behind. But uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm glad that he put that up on uh, going up by the river. And uh, still talking about the contribution, we have uh, two names uh, that are very popular in Liberia, Kukatona. Mm -hmm. Everybody says that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if Kuku Jumukutu is, is Pele, I, I don't know. But if you look at the Pele language, those things that are, and uh, then uh, like the Tipote Hade Susuku, which is also some Pele variation. Correct? Uh, yes, Kuka Tono, uh, in, in modern Liberia, the, the first president to actually uh, use that word, Kuka Tono, was William R. Tobert. Uh, following the April 14 full riot, a rice riot, uh, when um, he delivered uh, his address to the nation, 
uh, he made mention of that phrase, which means that all of us are one. All right. So uh, we're about to draw down the curtains. It's been a very fruitful discussion on the history and culture of the Pele ethnic group. And uh, before we close the curtains, if you have any final comments on the history and the culture of the Pele ethnic group and your just general comments. Well, I mean, my, my comment uh, has always been that uh, as, as a, an individual belonging to that tribe, um, there is tremendous pride. Uh, Pala is just a tribal identity. I'm a Liberian uh, primarily. Uh, but what identifies me is that it's a tribe, and, and, and I'm always uh, privileged to be a part of that. Um, and, and, and the contribution that, that is to be made in Liberia probably um, is not important. But as an individual, uh, that contribution has to be uh, one that is, that is centrally um, found in peace. And that's the attribute, single most important attribute of a fellow person that I know of uh, being peaceful. Uh, and if we can all become uh, that peace ambassador or peace element or one that is able to uh, make peace with, with others, I think that we will have a, a very good country. Uh, secondly, farming, uh, if we can always continue to go back to the soil like the flood man once was, uh, I believe that we can be self-sufficient uh, in rice production. Because a country that cannot feed itself um, is not uh, truly independent, as 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 it think. And so, typically, uh, those few attributes are very important to me. And the third one, of course, which is very valuable, is education. Because uh, a nation that does not value education is bound to fall, especially uh, in the direction that we're headed globally. And so, those three things are very important. And I hope that. Uh, we can continue as a pellet tribe continue to make some dense contribution or contributions in those areas. Uh, close, Dennis, I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity. I, I consider it a privilege uh, having shared this forum with some men before me, like Dr. Now Calvin Want Tire and, and others who have come um, before me. I'm very privileged for that. Uh, and I want to thank you and your crew. Uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am to. Uh, to everyone, but specifically Stephanie, she is one heck of a, a system person. Um, she hunted me down everywhere I went, and that's good. I say thank you for your show. I'm going to do that. It's very educational. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gassini, for availing yourself for this discussion. I want to thank all our viewers on Facebook and also YouTube and those who are watching wherever you are. We want to say thank you so much for this, uh, for this time. Uh, without you, we can't be here. So continue to support us, continue to do what we do so that we can continue to carry on focus on Liberia. I want to say a special thank you to my producer, Mrs. Yasendi martin -Kwee. Also my guest relations manager and product engineer, Mrs. Stephanie logan Cetro. And uh, Mr. Gassini, again, thank you so much for this time. Next week, we're going to be discussing the history and culture of the Klao or crew ethnic group. So uh, Professor Dr. K. Moses Nambi will be our guest and you sure don't want to miss that. Until then, from all of us here at Focus on Liberia, my name is Dennis Jazz saying so long. Enjoy the pellet music as we close. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, that's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Pele ethnic group. And we want to thank all of you for watching. We love you to come back. We are sustained through member support. So support us, call us, call our guest relations manager and see how well you can contribute. If you have people who want to uh, contribute or be on the show, either from the uh, other ethnic group, please don't hesitate to call us. Until then, my name is Dennis Ja, and I say good night and God bless you. Thank you.